Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's good stuff, man. Hey, guys, I want to do something before we get started. I want us to just take a minute and, and pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in California, if we can do that this morning. Um, on Friday, uh, many of the churches in California received letters. Actually, on their door, they came knocking on their doors and said, if you assemble together this Sunday, we're going to shut your water and your power off. So that's all right, you can't shut the power of God off. So, you know, you shut our power off all you want. You know, you can't shut off the power of God. So, um, so I just think we just need to take a couple minutes right now and just pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ out there in California, um, especially those that are going to stay open and gather and, and worship. And uh, this song was just perfect for today, man. And uh, no matter what's going on in our world, guys, again, we just need to make it a point to worship. He's still worthy, guys. Even in the valley, guess what? He's still worthy. And um, I know many of you feel like you're in a valley today, but guess what? Our God is still worthy of our worship and our praise. And so let's just pray for our, our brothers and sisters out there and also pray for our service here this morning. Father, we come to you just thankful. God, you are worthy of our worship and our praise. God, whether we are on the mountaintop or whether we are in the valley, God, you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And Father, no matter what happens in this life, God, you are still worthy of our worship, worthy of our adoration, worthy of our praise. But Father, we come this morning to pray for our dear brothers and sisters in Christ there in California. Father, I pray for every one of those pastors, those leaders of those churches. God, help them to continue to be courageous. God, may you protect them and their congregations. And Father, I pray that a mighty revival would take place in the state of California today. Father, I pray that God's people would just get on their faces before a holy God and cry out to you. Father, that lives would be changed as a result of this. I pray for the leadership of California. God, did they see the power of God unleashed in California today? And so, Father, I pray today as well for this service. Father, I pray for revival here today. God, I pray that as we get into the Word of God, as we allow the Word of God to get into us today, Father, that it would penetrate deeply into our spirits today, in our hearts, that we leave this place different than what we came in. And God, most importantly, I pray that if there's anybody here today that's never been born again, Father, today would be the glorious day of their salvation. So, Father, we commit this time into your hands right now, and we ask that you would do a mighty work in each and every life today. And for those watching as well, God, I pray that their lives will be changed as well today. And we'll thank you for all that you do in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you all have ever had a dream? How many of you have ever had a bad a dream that just shook you to your core? And you just woke up and probably had cold sweats. And you're like, man, what in the world did I just dream? Anybody ever been there? How many of y'all have ever forgotten a dream that the dream was just so troublesome and, and, and again, you just don't, you don't remember all the details of the dream, but you knew there was something about that dream that troubled you? Anybody been there? We see in Daniel chapter number two, we see, King, we see King Nebuchadnezzar. He has, he has, in verse number one, the Bible says he has dreams, and then later on he has a dream. This one dream just absolutely just troubled him. And I'm so thankful that God used even wicked pagan kings, again, to, to share prophetic truth. The reality was that, and, and I love this chapter of Scripture, because, again, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, right? And then he calls for all of his magicians and sorcerers and astrologers and Chaldeans to come and meet with him. And so they can tell him not the interpretation of the dream, but he wants to know what was in my dream first and foremost. And then he also wants to know the interpretation of the dream. So I, I preface all this to say this, that you have to come back next week to hear the interpretation of the dream. I don't have enough time today to give you what God's given me today, plus the interpretation of the dream. So I had to break it down into at least two sermons. It may even be more. So, but you have to come back next Sunday, same bat time, same bat channel. Come back next Sunday to hear the interpretation of the dream. But guys, this, this dream shook him to the core so much, again, that he calls for all of his wise men to come, and again, to help him to, not, not to hear the interpretation of the dream, but he wants to know, hey, what did I dream? 
And I love how, how, again, how the Word of God and the response of all these, all these wise men. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter number 2. The Lord gave, again, Nebuchadnezzar this, this, this vivid dream that he, did, he couldn't understand, and, and it absolutely distressed him. And again, verse number 1, it says he, it troubled him. And again, that word troubled in, that, in verse number 1 means there was a deep disturbance in Nebuchadnezzar's life, in his spirit. And so as we come to this, verse number one, it says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. And again, it, it disturbed him so much, guys, that he just kept waking up. Anybody have sleepless nights? Many of you probably have sleepless nights right now, right? Let me just say all this say this, guys. Don't lose sleep over anything that's going on, okay? God's got this. There's no, no need to lose stress or lose sleep over all the distress that's going on in this world because I can promise you this. At the end of the day, who will be victorious? God will. Not only God, but we will. We're victorious, okay, guys? Again, read the back of the book if you don't believe me. That's your homework assignment this week. If you're distressed, if you're battling issues and anxiety and things, read the back of the book. Find out we're still victorious. We still got a home in heaven. We got mansions waiting for us. We still win. So again, he's very distressed, very troubled by this dream. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, for to show the king the dream. So they came and stood before the king. Today, these would be your, your psychic readers, your Sandra Browns and your palm readers. Anybody ever had your palm read? Please don't admit to that. You ever went to Sandra Brown and had her, the psychic, you know, predict your future quit doing that too quit reading horoscopes this is what all this comes from guys is this right here and by the way this everything the psychics and everything today are not new guys we've had them for six thousand years moses even dealt with these same types of people so again he calls for all these people why and again they came and they stood before the king and the king said unto them i have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream so again, he calls for these scholars, he calls for all these folks, these magicians, these fortune tellers, these astrologers to come. And so again, the king's heart is an indication that he considered this dream and the interpretation very significant about the future of his kingdom. And again, the reality was that, that in spite of the, all the knowledge that these wise men had, guys, their power was still very limited. They had power, and where do you think their power came from? Not from God. Their power came from the devil himself. And guys, again, say that to say this, Satan is still a master counterfeiter. He's still, he's, he's a counterfeiter. How many believe there's one way to heaven? Okay, but how many does Satan tell you there is? You pick and choose your own way. And again, the whole Oprah Winfrey theology, and I know she's not watching today, but People have this mindset that it's not just Christ. It's, 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 it's I can pick and choose my own way to heaven. Guys, you, if you're picking and choosing your way to heaven, it's the wrong way. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. So again, they had power, and their power came from Satan, but guys, their power was very limited. And can I just say this to every single person in here today? His power is still limited today. Satan's is. But God's power is unlimited. He is all-powerful. He's omnipotent, guys. He's all-powerful. But again, they, they, they show up, and the king's wanting to know, again, the dream and the interpretation. And again, these four groups were supposed to be the experts in dreams. And again, the, the king asked for He wanted them to tell what was in his dreams, not just to interpret the dream itself. Then we come to verse number four, three and four. The king said, I have dreamed a dream. Verse four, they spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. So again, from here to the end of chapter number seven, the language changes from Hebrew to Aramaic. He says, tell thy, what's the next word, church? Servants. You know, it's, notice it's plural. These four were wise for a reason. Listen, not a single one of them wanted to take this on individually. But here's what they said. If we can put our collective heads together and our thoughts together, maybe we can come up with something, some solution to appease the king. Again, not dummies, are they? But again, let's keep reading. 
the thing is gone from me. If you will make known unto me the dream and the inter verse number five, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, what's going to happen? <laughs> now, now again, guys, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the, the smartest person in the world, but, but here, this is just me. If, if King Christ makes this decree and says, listen, if you can't tell me what's going on in my, in my head, in my dream, and not only that, but if you can't interpret it, I'm going to cut you into pieces and make your house a dunghill. Can I just say this? I'd be making some stuff up. Here's what was in your dream, King. You was at Taco Bell last night. You ate some food you shouldn't have ate. This is why you're having these bad dreams. But again, guys, he, he's threatening. Now there's this threat that if you can't tell me what was in my dream and interpret it as a, also, you're going to be cut in pieces. So in verses 5 and 6, here's what the king does. He gives them two different choices. If you can interpret it, if you can't interpret it, you're cut in pieces. But if you can, you'll be rewarded. Right? That's what I mean, guys. I'd be making some stuff up. I'd be getting to see four of us. I'd be getting with Mark Blair and Rick Fussnecker and... And Ed Dooley and say, listen, let's come up together. Let's, let's get some story together and let's just appease the king. He'll buy it. No, Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't buy it because he was a pretty sharp man himself. So again, we see this threat, but also a promise that if anybody will interpret this, then they'll be rewarded in verse number seven. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants a dream and we will show the interpretation of it. So here's, here's what they're saying, guys. We want to help you, king. We want to interpret this dream for you, but we can't because we don't know what's in the dream. If you'll just tell us what you dream, then we'll come up with an interpretation. Verse number eight. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time. He said, you know what? Listen, I knew you were going to stall. <laughs> I knew you were going you were, you were to stall for time in this. Then verse number nine. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there's but one decree. So again, he's letting them know, again, that if you don't tell me what was in the dream and what the interpretation of it is, guess what's going to happen? Cut in pieces. Your house of dunghill. I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Guys, they got something right. They said, listen, king, there is absolutely not a human being on this planet that can do what you're asking us to do. Not only did they say that to the king, but they also said, hey, listen, king, there's not been a king, a lord, or any other leader that is asked of somebody else what you are asking of us. And it is a rare thing that the king requires, verse number 11, there's none other that can show it before the king except the gods notice it's little g-o-d whose dwelling is not with flesh so again they're saying nothing on this earth can do this and look at verse number 12 for this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of babylon and the decree, the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain as well. So it wasn't just the astrologers and magicians, the Chaldeans, and, and, and those group of wise men. It was also Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And could you imagine those four? Wait, wait, hold on a second. We weren't even around. But again, he said, send for them too, that they would be destroyed. Then I love verse number 14. Take the lid off, dummy. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch. Arioch was the executioner. He was the one that was paid to execute all the wise men, including Daniel and, 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 the, three, and the three friends. Now, stop here for a second. Picture this. Two weeks ago, I told you to write three words down. Compromise, courage, and confidence, right? Courage. Who approached Arioch? Daniel. Do you think Daniel had courage and confidence in God? Guys, he is standing before the person whose life, I mean, his life is in this man's hands. 
and the courage and confidence that he had, guys, and the confidence and the faith that he had in his God to know that, again, God's going to take care of me, but I'm going to be courageous, and I'm going to go on not just behalf of us four, but on behalf of everybody else. I'm going to be the go-between. I'm going to represent us. I'm going to go to Arioch, again, with confidence and courage and counsel and wisdom, to Arioch, captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And look what he says. And he said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the king so hasty? Why is he in such a hurry? <laughs> can, can we just sit down and talk about this? Now, verse number 12, what did we find out about the king? He was angry. And it, the Bible doesn't say he was just furious. He was very furious. Guys, there's emphasis on his anger. He wasn't just mad because he stubbed his toe, guys. He was mad enough that he was out for blood. That he wanted people to die. He answered and said, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went, man, this is good. He went in and desired of the king that he would give time, that he would show the king the interpretation. Here's what he's saying. Set up a meeting. Set up a meeting with me and the king. <laughs> Hold on a second. This guy just said he's going to cut you into pieces and make your house a dunghill, but you want to meet with him. Is anybody signing up for that assignment? Because do, do, you, do you understand the courage and faith that it takes to be able to do what Daniel was doing? In spite of what was going on around him, guys, he knew that God was with him. And he knew that God had protected him before, and God was going to protect him again. And guys, again, the message to the church today is this, guys. The same God that protected us in January is the same God that's protecting us today. That's not changed. And again, the master deceiver, Satan himself, guys, has got us just absolutely believing everything that has been thrown at us. Listen, if God cared about you, why is this going on? If, if God loves us so much, why is this happening in America? If God this, if God that. And so I always say this, well, if God's people would, if God's people did, if God's people this, and if God's people that. And boy, you, won't, you can imagine how quickly that shuts that conversation up. But again, he's, he goes on behalf of him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the rest of the wise men, and said, you know what, set up a meeting with the king. I'll talk to him. Then Daniel went to his house, and guys, here's, here's the, the first thing that we can learn from this tonight, today. Daniel went to his house. He made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, again, their Hebrew names, his companions that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish and the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Guys, here's point number one. No matter what's going on, it's time to pray. Guys, what is the first thing that Daniel decides to do, guys, after he says, let's set up a meeting with the king? He goes home and he asks Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to do what? Cry out for the mercies of God. And ask God, he's specific, ask God to reveal the dream and the interpretation of it. Guys, do we want, let me ask you this, guys. Do we want to see change in America? Let, honestly, no, don't say yes if, we're not, if we don't believe it, if we don't want it. Do we want to see change in the United States of America? Do we want to see change in our homes? And by the way, guys, the, the kids and, and, and youth are what's being attacked today. They're coming after our kids. Do we want to see change? Then you know what it's time for God's people to do? Pray. And pray specifically. Here's what I mean about praying specifically. Quit complaining about your national leaders and just ask God to remove them. What year is this? What's going on in November? You want to make a difference? Pray. You don't like certain people in, in government positions? Start praying that God removes them. Because what did we learn a couple weeks ago? 
He raises up kings, but he also does what? He removes them. <laughs> but be specific. Daniel was very specific with God. How many of y'all just pray like this? You know what, Lord, just, just bless our home. Lord, forgive me my sins. Lord, just, no. Now, now, is there anything wrong with praying like that? No. But when you get specific with God, you know what you're telling God? You're getting serious with God. When you specifically, I'm going to mess up, I'm going to say pacific here in a minute. Specifically, what sins you have committed, you know what you've just told God? God, I have dishonored you with what I just looked at or what I said or what I read or whatever, whatever, whatever sin you are confessing. But being very specific with God when you pray. Because I've shared this story before, I believe, and when I was in Bible college, there was a, a, a man, he was, he was in the military, he was in Germany, and he surrendered to, go, to preach, and so he was, coming to Bible, he was coming to Jacksonville, Florida to go to Bible college. So he's moving to Jacksonville, Florida in early spring, you know, late spring, early, early summer. So he's in Germany at this, time, at this time, but he starts praying for a car. Not just any car. He tells God the kind of car he wants, what needs to be on the inside of the car, and everything else. Jacksonville, Florida. Anybody been to Florida in the, in the summer? It's nice and cool there. So what do you think the first thing he asked God for was in his car? Air conditioning. Good on gas. Small car, but, but big enough for his family. But then, then this is what blew me away. He, he prays specifically for a hatchback with louvers on it. Guys, and, and, I, and I promise you guys, I'm not making this up. And Todd, if you're watching today, verify this for me. When he shows up to Jacksonville, Florida, guess what was awaiting him? A small car, hatchback, with louvers, air conditioning, and 30-something miles to the gallon. For free. He didn't pray for that, but God gave him that. He specifically prayed for it. And guys, that was a, that's always been a reminder in my life that it's okay to be very specific with God. Whatever it is that's on our, on our hearts to pray for. How many of y'all want loved ones to be saved? Have you been specific with God to pray for their, just their salvation? Guys, anytime somebody calls me with a prayer request, you know, one of the first things I'll ask is, is your loved one saved? Because you know what's more important to me than their physical health is their spiritual condition. Because guess what, guys? We can die healthy and go to hell. Or we can leave this earth just in awful sickness and spend eternity in heaven. What would you rather have? But guys, prayer, prayer, prayer. Guys, now's not the time to quit praying. Now's the time to be even more fervent in our prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man does what, church? Availeth much. Do we believe prayer works? Can I hear an amen? amen. Then let's get back to praying. Let's get back on our knees. Let's cry out to God for America that God's mercies would be upon the United States, upon our churches and our pastors and God's people. So Daniel looked at the situation, guys, and he says, listen, I've got a meeting with the king, so I'm going to go home, I'm going to spend some time, all night prayer meeting, and I love this, guys, again, because you can come to verse number 19. Then the, then the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. What do you think Daniel prayed for? God, show me the dream and the interpretation of it. And what does the Bible say? How many of you believe the Bible? Amen, 100% truth. <laughs> He reveals the dream and the interpretation to Daniel. Because Daniel was serious and because Daniel had courage and confidence in his God that he knew that if I just cry out to God, number one, he's going to hear me. Can somebody say I'm thankful this morning that God still hears the cries of his children? And he's just waiting for us to cry out to him in this time, guys. Let's quit complaining about what's going on in this world and start praying to God. You know why we complain so much? It's easier to complain than it is to pray. I 
I don't like what's going on, but you know what, guys? It hasn't stopped me from praying. As a matter of fact, guys, it has driven me further to my knees. But to pray. Then the second point, guys, is verse number 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the time and seasons. He removes kings, sets up kings, gives wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep secret, secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and what, church? <laughs> Two of you heard that said it. I thank thee and what? Guys, answered prayer should always lead to praise. Y'all didn't hear me. Answered prayer should always lead to praise. Guys, how can we not praise the King of kings and Lord of lords? Guys, how can we not praise the one who died on the cross for our sins so that we don't have to pay our sin debt? Jesus Christ paid our sin debt for us. And because of that, guys, how can we not praise him? Man, it's time for the worshipers to arise. It's time for God's people to say, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm just going to get my praise on. Hallelujah. Watch how the world responds when God's people says, you know what? I'm going to praise you through the storm. I'm going to praise you when nobody else is praising you. Listen, if I am the only one with my hands lifted up and shouting praises to your name, then so be it. Man, the world needs to see that, church. They don't need to see the church walking around ho-hum and, you know, like schlep rock on the Flintstones. Some of y'all are like, what are the Flintstones? Never mind. Just Google search it when you get home. Y'all know who schlep rock was? He always had the black cloud and the rain over his head. And you know what? I feel like that's where the church is right now, guys. Listen, we don't have to walk around with a black cloud raining down on us all the time, guys. We've got victory. We need to start praising God because of answered prayer. Can I ask you this? Has God ever answered anybody's prayer in this building today? Did you praise him for it? And I love what Daniel praised God for. And again, he says, verse 20, he says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. And again, that gives that personal relationship. For wisdom and might are his. He prays, prays God because he understands that all knowledge and wisdom come from where? From God. Verse 21, he changes the times and seasons. He gives wisdom unto the wise, knowledge to them that have understanding. He reveals secrets to his children. He knows what's in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Thou, my Father, has given me wisdom and might, has made known unto me that we desire of thee, for thou hast not made known unto the king's, the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, this is what I love, guys, whom the king ordained to destroy the men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. And guys, here's the thing, guys. The wise men of Babylon had no idea that Daniel went before Arioch and the king on their behalf and spared their life. Can I just get real with you for a minute? I've, I've heard this I don't know, too much, to be honest. Pastor, I'm only one person. I can't make a difference. Pastor, I'm one man. Pastor, I'm one woman. Pastor, I'm one this. Pastor, I'm one that. In this story, how many people went before the king? Do you think Daniel made a difference? How many of y'all are familiar with the Apostle Paul? <laughs> How many times do you see a Paul surrounded by people in ministry? Not very often. Man, that guy's always in jail, man. I can't spend time with him. I don't want to go to jail. Guys, one person can make a difference. Guys, you know why we don't have prayer in schools today? It wasn't a group of people, one person. 
You know why we still butcher babies in America today? It wasn't because a group of people that got abortion passed, guys. It was one person. One person can make a difference, guys. And what did I tell you guys a couple weeks ago about, about being courageous? Courage is contagious, guys. If we'll see somebody in this church start showing some courage, you know what else is going to happen? People around them will start becoming more courageous. And so again, Daniel goes before the king in verse 24. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot, I love this, guys, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? And, and, and I wish that they would have put in parentheses sarcasm. Because you know what Daniel was saying to the king? Hey, what about your boys, man? <laughs> well, you got all these wise men on your staff here, man. They couldn't tell you anything? They couldn't tell you what your dream was, and they couldn't interpret the dream for you? Hey, where's your wise men at? Where's your astrologers, your palm readers, your, your, your mind readers, your fortune tellers? But remember, what did the wise men say? There was no man on earth that can do what the king was asking him to do. But verse 29, verse 28, guys, gosh, this is so good. But there is a God in heaven. Anybody glad this morning there's still a God in heaven that's watching over us and, 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 and again, just, just doing great and, and mighty works even through these difficult times that God is still moving and changing lives. There's a God in heaven that does what? Reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. That's where I have to stop. That's why you have to come back next week. As Paul Harvey said, come back next week for the rest of the story. But you see, guys, Daniel knew this. Daniel knew that not even he had the power in and of himself. But he said there is a God in heaven that reveals secret things. Daniel 1.17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel did. Guys, Daniel was also a man of prayer. He was a man of praise. And again, he was a man of knowledge and wisdom, but he also knew where his knowledge and wisdom came from. It came from God himself. When we can learn, again, God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. We learn all those from this, just this passage, guys. He was with Daniel in Judah, and he's also with Daniel in Babylon. That's not around the corner. And Daniel knew that. And again, Daniel and his friends understood this, guys, that as long as we are faithful to God, God will be faithful to us. Guys, please, he, it, it, again, if you don't leave with anything else today, we'll do leave with the fact that we need to pray. But guys, now is not the time to walk away from God. Now's not the time to become unfaithful. Church, listen to me. Now is the time for the church to become even more faithful to God and the things of God. Prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, witnessing, just, just living holy. It's not the time, guys, to start becoming unfaithful. It's time to, again, become even more faithful. Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Anybody thankful for God's promises this morning? He says, listen to me. If you'll call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and then you will glorify me. Daniel and his friends, guys, made a very specific request to God. And God gave a very specific answer. Again, the wise men, Daniel and his buddies, 
they were all delivered as a, as a result of one man. One man who had confidence in God. One man who was courageous enough to stand against the authorities of his time and say, you know what, listen, why are you in such a rush? I can do this for you. I can help you through this. Psalm Matthew 5, 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I don't see it in there, but I believe Daniel prayed for Nebuchadnezzar that night, specifically. And I believe he also prayed for all the magicians and sorcerers and astrologers. And like I said, guys, it's not time to be critical of our nation's leaders. It's time to pray for them. I told somebody yesterday, I said it's, uh, it's fascinating in the Bible, and maybe you guys have a verse because I can't find it, where it says that we're commanded to criticize our leaders. But we are commanded to pray for them. Pray for kings. Pray for all those who are in authority. That's a command that God has given to us as a church. And guys, I'm lying if I tell you I've not been critical. I'd be lying to you. But man, I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit of God that says, you know what, listen, if you're going to be critical, you better be praying for them. I criticized our governor this week. I laughed at first, and God forgave me for that because I, I repented. Because I thought, no, that's, that's not the right thing to do either. Guys, we got a great country. A great country, guys, that was founded upon the, the very foundation of God's precious word. The morals and, and the principles of God's word. And we're slowly starting to get away from it. And it's time for God's people to start being more courageous, confident, faithful, prayer-minded. And through all that, spend some time praising. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Guys, isn't that good? Let me read it one more time. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious. Amen. Full of compassion. Amen. Slow to anger. Great mercy. He is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Guys, we need some Daniels in our churches. We need some men that will stand the gap. We need some men to say, you know what? I'm going to be courageous. Now, when I say courageous, guys, I'm not talking about we go out here with our guns blazing and we act foolish. That's not what I'm saying, guys. I'm saying that we become wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but we, come, we become courageous and confident in God, knowing that God's going to take care of us when we're courageous enough to take a stand for him. I know it's not easy, guys. And, you know, even if you have to stand alone, I know we don't like to be alone in times like this, do we? But even if you have to stand alone through this time, guys, I honestly believe this, God will honor it. And when our ways please him, the Bible tells us that he'll make even our enemies to be at peace with us. Anybody got any enemies in here today? Nobody? Liars. <laughs> Now I got to preach on the Ten Commandments. So, see, y'all messed up. Y'all should have just shook your head yes. Now we got to stay longer. I'm kidding. But guys, even when we, when our ways please Him, so ask yourself today: What in my life is not pleasing to God today? What in my life right now is not pleasing to my Savior? And then your assignment this week is to work on that. Whether it's your prayer life or your Bible reading or, or sharing the gospel or, or whatever it may be, just living a holy life, being obedient. Maybe 
it's serving. You're just being disobedient to God in your service. But just ask God to search your heart today. Say, Father, what in my life right now is not pleasing to you? What do I need to work on? And if you're serious about it and you're specific about it, you know what God's going to do? The same thing he did for Daniel. He's going to answer you specifically. He's going to reveal to you what you need to work on. Let me ask you this, and I want you all to be honest. Because I'm going to be honest with you. How many of y'all have work to do? There's things in your life right now that are messed up. That you know they're not right with God. You know the good thing is? He is a God full of mercy, full of compassion, full of grace, full of love. And I don't know about anybody else, I am so thankful I serve a God of the second, third, fourth, 4,000, however many chances we're on right now. That's my God. That's your God. And he's not going anywhere, guys. Some of you right now, you're struggling, saying, man, where's God? His presence is, is, is not with me right now. You know what that always causes me to do, guys? Self-examination. What is it in my life right now that's hindering His presence from being so real to me right now? Is it a life of sin? Is it a life of just disobedience, whatever it is? But my hope and prayer today is this, guys, is that, again, we as children of God understand the times that we're living in but we also don't bow down and say, you know what, this is over, the church will never be the same, and this, that, and the other. You know, I've said this, guys, from day one of this, I believe the, the church is going to look even more beautiful through this. I believe a mighty revival is coming. Some of you won't like it. I'm going to love it. I hope it's weeks. We just order pizza. We just stay here for weeks, guys. But it's not going to come unless we are serious about this. Courageous, confident, faithful to God. Let's stay faithful to Him today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. These altars are open this morning. You can do business with God right there in your seat. But there's just something about coming to an altar. And again, I know that times are different. But there's just something about coming to an altar and doing business with God. I can't explain it. I know biblically there were always altars being built. And, and again, just, just people just spending time at an altar and getting God's attention. Getting on our knees and on our face before God and crying out for His mercy. And right now, today, the most important thing that you can cry out to God for is this. Salvation. You're here today and you're not saved. You're here today and there's uncertainty in your spirit today. You're here today and you say, Pastor Tim, I know I'm not saved. Pastor, I know that if I died today, I wouldn't go to heaven. And let me just tell you this this morning about salvation. The Bible tells us that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a single person in this building today that is without sin. We're all sinners in God's eyes. We can never, we miss the mark of God's holiness. We can never live up to God's holiness in and of ourselves. The Bible also reminds us that the wages of sin is death. There's a penalty for our sin. That word death is not just talking about our physical dying. Death just means separation. The worst kind of death is spiritual death. That's separation from God for all of eternity in a place called hell. And that's bad news. So many people think, well, if I just do enough good works or... You know, if I'm a good enough person, if I just show up to church and I'll say a few prayers and, and if I read my Bible enough, that's going to be good enough. God will be happy and he'll let me into heaven. 
No. See, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can never work enough to get to heaven. The work's already been done. You see, 2,000 years ago, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Jesus Christ laid his life down on the cross. He paid the penalty for us. He made a way for us to be reconciled to a holy God through his death. And that would be bad news if the story ended there. Because you see, Jesus was placed in a tomb. And three days later, he rose again, conquering sin and conquering death and conquering the grave. In the very moment we give our lives to Christ, guess what? We conquer sin and we conquer death and we conquer the grave. Romans chapter 10 says, For with the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here today, as honest as you can be, I don't know your heart, but God does. I promise I won't embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But what I want to do above everything else right now is pray for you. If you would say, Pastor Tim, I'm not saved. Pastor, would you pray for me right now if you just slip up your hand? Anybody in this building today? Thank you. Anyone else? Pastor Tim, I'm not saved. Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? And then here's what I want to do this morning. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. If you want to give your life to Christ today, and you don't feel comfortable coming up, listen, you can get saved right there in your seat. You can cry out to God today. You can, you can cry out to God and say, Lord, I, I am a sinner. And I know there's a penalty for my sin. I deserve that penalty. But God, today I come to you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were buried and you rose again three days later. God, forgive me of my sins. God, I turn from my life today. I turn from my old sinful ways and I turn to you. Jesus, I ask you today to be my Lord and my Savior. I ask you today to forgive me of my sins. I ask you today to help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. So if you just want to pray that prayer, listen, the prayer itself will not save you. It's you believing in the prayer and you turning your life around and giving it to Christ. And you begin to live with him. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So if you raise your hand today, and you say, yes, that's what I want to do. Would you raise your hand again for me? Thank you, thank you. And the church, let's pray for these right now. And those that raised your hand, just repeat after me. Like I said, this prayer will not save you in and of itself but you believing what you pray today say dear Jesus I know I'm a sinner and I deserve hell but Jesus today I come to you and I ask you today to forgive me of my sin Jesus, I believe you died on the cross in my place. You died for my sins. And Jesus, today, I believe you rose again three days later. Dear Jesus, I ask you today to forgive me of my sins. And I ask you today to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, help me today 
to live a life that's pleasing to you. Jesus, I thank you so much for loving me, and I commit my life into your hands today. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed for just another second. If you prayed that prayer and you sincerely, sincerely meant it, would you raise your hand for me one more time? Thank you, thank you. Hey, church, can we rejoice today? Can we rejoice and get excited today that two people gave their life to Christ today? And child of God, how about you this morning? With your heads bowed and your eyes still closed, I promise we're almost done. You say, Pastor Tim, would you please just pray for me during this invitation time? It's been a rough week. It's been a rough five, six, seven months. Pastor, I've, I've lost my job. I've, I've lost whatever. I, I'm just, my, my relationship with God is not what it once was. I want that to be restored today. Pastor Tim, would you please just pray for me right now? Is that you this morning? If you slip up your hand right now. My hands are up. I want you to pray for me as well. Thank you all over this building. Anybody else right now before I pray? Heavenly Father, once again, words cannot express the joy of sinners coming home, of sinners giving our life to Christ. And Father, today we rejoice that you are still saving lives and still saving sinners from their sin. And Father, for every hand that was lifted up as children of God, Father, this has been tough on so many. Depression, anxiety, discouragement, but Father, I pray today that we leave this place highly encouraged, challenged by what we have heard and seen here today. Father, forgive us. And Lord, as we sing this one verse of an invitation song, turn our eyes upon Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we would sing that out as a prayer to you today. So Father, we love you and we thank you for all this in Jesus' name.